you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me over to the book of Exodus. So we're still in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, in chapter uh, 15. I'm sorry, chapter uh, 17. Chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 8 through 16 of Exodus chapter 17. Fairly familiar passage of Scripture for most of us. Scripture says, beginning in verse 8, Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. Jehovah Nissi. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. There is an old Indian fable that tells the story of six blind men. One day they were each carried into this local courtyard and they were sort of moved up towards uh, where an elephant was standing. And the first blind man touched the side of the elephant and he said, it's like a wall. Uh, the second touched the trunk of the elephant. He said, it's like a snake. The third touched the tusk of the elephant and said, it's like a spear. The fourth touched the leg and said, it's like a tree. The fifth touched the ear and said, it's like a fan. And the sixth touched the tail and said, it's like a rope. And the point of the story is that they really all missed the true character of what it was that they were touching of the elephant. Because each of them had really only touched the elephant in one part or one section. They'd only gotten a small, small feel from what the elephant really was. Well, in a very real sense, there's a lot of us who may have touched God in a, in a significant way, certainly, uh, through salvation, but maybe we've never, ever really personalized the God who redeemed us, the God who reached down through Jesus Christ and saved us from our sin and from ourselves and from an eternal hell. We, we really didn't misjudge the character of God because we really didn't judge the character at all because we got saved and we got our sins forgiven. But from that point on, God sort of just became this nebulous, invisible force in our lives, but somebody who really never got involved, and we never really saw him to be all that involved. But you know what? That's not really who God is. It's not the way that he really wants us to see him. It's not really the way that he wants us to know him. It's not really the way that he wants us to, to interact with him. He wants us really to see him as an active, vital, real part of our daily lives. In fact, that's really the way that the prophets, that's really the way that the people of Israel, that's really the way that the patriarchs and the Jews saw God on a day-to-day -day basis. If you ask them, who is God, then they would say something to you like, why, he's the one who is always faithful. He is the one who is always loving towards us. Why, he's the one who parted the waters at the Red Sea. Or he's the one who who saved us out of Egypt and brought us up out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery and bondage. Or they would say, he's the one who made the bitter waters at Marah sweet. Or he's the one who, who helped us walk up over that imploded wall in Jericho. In other words, they, 
they could and they would point to places. They would point to people. They would point to activities and events in their lives when you asked them who God was because that's the way they knew him. They knew him as an active, benevolent presence in their life. Not just a God who was sort of at a distance. Not just a God who was sort of ethereal and out there in the, in the, in the great ozone of life. But instead it was this God who was active and daily in the ever-present moment of the now in their lives. They knew him more than just as a God they met on a Sunday morning. They knew him as a God they met all the time, who was always with them, who was always there. He was not just a God of, of the quick fix or the God of the need that, was, uh, that, that was, was held at the moment. They knew him actively, and they knew him daily, and they knew him intimately in that razor-thin moment of the now. Well, that's really the way that God really wants us to know him. And so one of the ways that we can really get to know him in that way is if we get to know him in that manner the way they knew him in the Old Testament. And in the way that they knew him, particularly in the Old Testament, is as, as, as those events and those event, uh, places and those people and things that became monumental and uh, and so outstanding to them, he would name that pl- place, he would name that person, he would name it something, and it was a revelation of who he was. And so he revealed himself through various names in the Bible. And what he wants us to do is to learn that, th- that, that power and that potential that he has through those names of who he is. And then he wants us through our faith to match up our daily experiences with who he is as the God that we love and serve. Now we've come to learn him, uh, in, uh, learn about him in a different, in a couple of different ways. We've seen him as Adonai, as supreme master, ruler overall, as as Lord of all. We've seen him as El Shaddai, as Almighty God. We've seen him as Jehovah, as that as that covenant keeping, always faithful self-existent I am. The God who is never a was and the God who is never a will be, but the God who always is. We've seen him as Jehovah. We've seen him as Jehovah Jireh, God who is our provider. God who meets every need that we have. No matter what that need is, he knows that need in advance. And so the God who always meets that need, the God who's always been where we're going before we ever get there, that God is Jehovah Jireh. He is God, our provider. He is Jehovah Rophe. We saw him this way last week as our healer. That simply means that he is the God who is is the one who provides the cure for all things relative to our lives. Not just physical healing, but spiritual healing, emotional healing, mental healing, body, soul, and spirit. God cares about all of the components that we are, all of us as a human being, not just the physical. Sometimes that is so quick, that is so easy, that is so elementary. That's, that's just a, a, a basic thing that God can do. But more than that, God wants us well. God wants us whole. That's what he said. That's what Jesus said to that paralytic who had been paralyzed for 38 years sitting at the pool of Siloam, there at the pool Uh, waiting for the angel to stir the water for somebody to put him in. Jesus asked him, wilt thou be made whole? What a question to ask of a man for 38 years who's been sitting there paralyzed. What do you think he wants? Well, maybe he was trying to get him to do what Jesus was already declaring him to be. Jesus was wanting him to recognize you don't need men. You don't need the mode. You need the master who is, who is your healer, and the master is here. That's why I said, get up, take up your pallet and walk. Your faith has made you well. What God wants for us is to be our healer, not just our physical healer, yes, but our emotional, our mental, our body, soul, and spirit. He wants us whole, and so he is our healer. And We met him that way last week, but this morning, we want to look at him in another aspect, and that is as our banner, as our victory, Jehovah Nisi. And so what I want us to do this morning is the same way we've been doing it. I want us to look at the meaning of the word itself, the name, and then I want us to look at the manner in which it's used, the context in the Bible most often. And then I want us to look at what is the message for us? How does that apply to us? And so let's look at the, the, 
the meaning of Jehovah Nisi. You ever seen those old westerns where just about the time when the Indians were about to surround that caravan of cowboys and, and, and covered wagons, all of a sudden, just about the time they're about to do it, the cavalry comes in. Here comes the cavalry riding in, blowing the bugle, waving the flag, saving the day. Well, it's sort of that idea in terms of the name Jehovah Nisi. The, the term in Hebrew, Nisi, is, is a word that means to glisten or to shine or to glimmer. It actually comes from a root word. It's the word in Hebrew, Ness. And, and it described an object that looks sort of like a carved figurine or this, this molded sculpture from a piece of bronze. And usually there was an inscription on it in some, some way. There was the name of a tribe, maybe, that was written on it. Or maybe it was a figure or an animal that represented that tribe uh, on that figurine. And what they do is they put these shiny carvings, these molded sculptures on these long stakes or these long poles that would reach way up into the sky. And they would actually use them to rally folk to gather folks together. Maybe it was for battle, or maybe it was to signal a victory. Victory had been won. Maybe it was to call everybody to come join them in celebrating the victory that had been won. For instance, when Israel left Sinai for the land of Canaan, the Bible says that they marched under the banner or the Nisi of four tribes, Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan. They marched under that banner. In Isaiah 49, the Bible says that the upraised hand of God becomes the Nisi or the banner under which the nations bring the sons and daughters of the Jews back to the land of Canaan. In Psalm chapter 23, David really gets the idea when he says this, that thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, have you ever thought about that? L listen to that again. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, have you ever asked yourself why David would be talking about a feast right smack dab in the middle of fighting? I mean, that's kind of a strange scenario. Why would he be talking about a banquet right in the middle of a battle? Well, what he's doing is he's talking about going to a banquet while you're in the middle of a battle, because the battle is won. In other words, you don't have to fight for the victory. You're fighting in the victory, and you're celebrating that in the battle. What he's saying is, we can go to the banquet because he's got the battle taken care of. We don't fight for victory. We fight in victory. What he's saying is that God is our victory. God is our shield. He is our defender. He's, he's, our, he's our, 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 our warrior. The battle's not won out there in the battlefield in the presence of our enemies. The battle's won before you and, ever, you and I ever get into the battlefield in the human heart that is 100% surrendered and committed to God. And so what Jehovah Nisi means is that God is our banner. God is our victory, he's the one who goes before us, and it is under him that we march. And so the banner in those days wasn't just a flag or a molded figurine. When that ornament was literally held up and you went under that ornament or that figurine, it was literally a call to come to battle, or it was literally a claim of victory that the war had already been won. And so you were to celebrate that, you were to rejoice in that. And so in terms of the meaning of this, it simply means God is our banner. God is our victory. It is him under whom we march and have our victory. Now, what in terms of the manner is this used? How is this used most frequently in the Bible and particularly here? Well, obviously, it's used most often in the context of warfare. And that's the way it's really used here in this particular passage. 
It's used in the context of this enormous battle between Israel and the Amalekites. Now remember where where we were a week or so ago. Israel had made it out of Egypt. God had worked in a mighty, miraculous way. God had done a mighty thing in getting the people of Israel out of Egypt on their way to Canaan. But you remember, three days into the wilderness, they hadn't had anything to eat. They hadn't had anything to drink. And so they said, well, you know what? We might as well just go back to Egypt. They started carping and complaining, and they started griping because they, their, their bellies were, were, uh, were hurting a little bit. They were, they were uh, a little bit disgusted. They were afraid that they were going to get sick. They were afraid that they were going to get diseases. Uh, they were having some problems uh, with their physical well-being. They thought they were just going to get sick and die out there in the wilderness. Remember, I said that they had been taken out of Egypt, but Egypt hadn't been taken out of them. And so God took them to a place called Mara, where the, the, the bitter waters of Mara to show them that he was their healer and that if they were going to make it through the wilderness of Sinai, it was going to be because he kept them well enough through that entire process to get them to Canaan. He wanted them to understand it wasn't going to be because of their efforts. It wasn't going to be because of their medicines. It wasn't going to be because of their soothsayers. It wasn't going to be because of anything they did. He wanted them to understand that if they were going to make it out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into Canaan, it was going to be because he was the one who kept them well enough to do it. He was their healer. So he took them to the bitter waters of Marah to show them that he was their healer, that he was Jehovah Rophi, that he was the one who was going to, in fact, keep them well through the entire thing, body, soul, and spirit. He was going to keep them whole and healthy as they went to the land of Canaan. And so God showed himself to be Jehovah Rophi. He showed himself to be their healer. Now, the first thing he does after the problem of the pool of Marah is he puts them face to face with a whole host of enemies called the Amalekites. And this isn't some kind of schoolhouse scuffle. I mean, this is the Amalekites. Now, I don't know if you remember anything about the Amalekites, but they were a formidable foe. They were a large group of folks, and and they were ultimately related. they They were really related directly to Esau. Now, you remember who Esau was. Esau was was the son, was the brother of Jacob the son of Isaac and Rebekah. He was the older son. And you remember how when he came out of the womb, Jacob came out holding on to his brother's heel. You know, just almost as if, it was almost like he was trying to pull him back in the womb so he could get out first. That's Jacob, the supplanter, the the deceiver. That's who he was. And you remember the whole story of what happened with Jacob and Esau. You remember how Esau had been out in the fields, working in the fields one day, and he was just famished from working in the fields one day, and he was so hungry that his belly was hurting, you know, his belly was bothering him. And so he came up to Jacob, and you remember what Jacob said? Jacob said, well, you know what? I got something here. I got some stew. I got some Brunswick stew. And it's, it's been stirring all day. And so what I can do, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to heat it up, I'm going to get it just right, get it boiling just like it wants. And I tell you what, if you will trade me your birthright, if you'll give me the birthright, then I'll give you my stew. And so here he was. He was the guy who cared more about his belly than his birthright. Cared more about the hunger pains that he had at that moment in time than he did about the eternal nature of what would ultimately come to him as the firstborn of his father. Now, this Esau, these Amalekites were the direct descendants from Esau. And Esau was the one who chose the things of this world, chose to feed his flesh rather than have the spiritual blessing of his birthright over. And so don't miss what the Bible's saying. And what the Bible's saying is we are to see this wasn't a physical, just, just a physical battle. This is the same battle that you and I are, are finding ourselves constantly, day in and day out, from the moment that we're saved. The minute we're taken out of our Egypt, we have the same battle. The first thing we face is not the devil. 
man alive, we give that joker too much credit. We're always giving him too much credit for what he's doing. The first thing we face after we get out of Egypt, after we get saved, is not the devil. The first thing we face is us. The first thing we face is our flesh. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, uh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. If you've been taken out of Egypt, that's the first thing that hits you. Listen, the, 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 the exodus out of Egypt is the picture of your salvation and my salvation. Egypt is the picture of you and me being taken out of our bondage, out of enslavement to the devil. Brother, if you've been taken out of Egypt, then the devil has been dealt a death blow on your behalf. When Christ died on the cross of Calvary, when he split the, uh, the death, hell, and the grave wide open, Satan was dealt a death blow. God in Christ became your victory. But let me tell you something. That doesn't mean that your battle stopped when Christ died at Calvary. Can I get an amen, man? Them, them battles still show up, don't they? If anything, it means they really started because the devil doesn't have any more authority over you and me than you and than what you and I allow him to have. The only way that he can ever defeat you or defeat me after you've been saved and I've been saved is through your flesh. What you and I let him lead us to do. What you and I allow him to convince, uh, to to uh, to uh, do with us or to us. When we allow him to convince us to choose our bellies over our birthright. When you choose to forfeit your spiritual blessing for something that just makes you feel good for the moment. And that's the battle that most of us live in every single day. We live somewhere between Egypt and Canaan. It's called the walk through the wilderness. It's called the battle of the flesh. You, do you know what the flesh is? I, I, I've said this to you before, but... Do you know what the best way to see the flesh is? When you start talking about the flesh, it's not necessarily your body, your physical body. The best way to think about it is spell it backwards. Spell flesh backwards and drop the H. What you got? I know I'm going to give you a minute to think that through. Self. That's exactly right. When, 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 if you want to know what the flesh really represents, it's self. And that's the thing that we, we are so, so bombarded with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's part of the daily difficulty of life is that we are confronted, not with Satan. Satan can only do what we allow him to do. It's when we face ourselves. And you know what self says? You know what self is about? Self is about an attitude and a disposition that says, I can do what I want to do. I can go where I want to go. I can, I can say what I want to say. And it's about an attitude that says, God, now you're good and fine over there as long as you stay in your zone, you stay in your area. But I am in control of my life. I know I needed you to get salvation. I got a little bit of fire insurance. I needed that. But God, as for the living of my daily life, I can call the shots. I don't need you. Self. And that's the problem. That's the walk of the wilderness. That's walking between Egypt and Canaan. When you and I try to control our destinies, when you and I try to manage our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's why when somebody comes along, maybe somebody's hurt you, maybe somebody's abused you, maybe somebody's accused you of something. Let me tell you, you know what the first thing is? Your flesh will tell you, get mad, get angry, get even. That's your flesh. That's yourself. God in Christ will say, forgive them. God in Christ will say, show them kindness. Love them. But your flesh says so many other things. Maybe it's God who's been trying to, to move you into a ministry or to get you to do something in your life and to step out in, in faith in, in a way that you haven't in a long time. And maybe you're struggling with that. Maybe you're having difficulty with saying yes to God because it's going to take up more of your time or more of your energy or more of your money or more of your effort. And you just don't want to say yes. That's flesh. That's the self. 
Maybe it's an attitude of pride or superiority that thinks you deserve more, you deserve better. Maybe it's some kind of, of lust or temptation or desire or addiction or habit or something that continues to eat at you and to drive you. That is about self. And that is your army of Amalekites. That's the army of Amalekites that, that Joshua was facing down in the lower part of the valley. And so, how is this term used? It's used most often in the context of warfare in the Bible, of battles. And let me tell you something, folks. The battle that you and I have is not the battle against Satan. The battle that we have is against ourself. And so, when we are able to, to see how God is our, uh, is our banner and our victory, then all of a sudden we can move from there into walk in what we already have. And so the manner in which it's used is in, is in the context of these daily difficulties, these daily struggles with this army of Amalekites called ourself. With all of the lust and the temptations and the pride of life and the lust, lust of the eyes and, and, the, and the arrogance and the pride and the disposition that says, God, I've got this, I don't need you. That is the way it's used. So what's the message for us of this name, Jehovah Nisi? The message is this, watch this, the message is live who he is. Appropriate it, fight in victory, not for victory. Stop trying to win something that you've already won. We work ourselves to death. We work so hard at trying to win something in life that we've already won. It's kind of like a little puppy dog that's chasing his tail. You ever seen a puppy dog chase their tail? It's, it's the most ridiculous thing. Why in the world would you want to catch your own tail? But those little guys will get out there and they'll start chasing their tail one day. And, and you notice how they never, ever seem to be able to catch their own tail. It's sort of an illusion, you know. It's a mirage. It's out there, but, man, I just can't get it, you know. But if they ever do get it, and some will, if they ever do get their tail, have you ever noticed how they don't know what to do with it? Like they kind of hold it for a minute. It's kind of hairy, you know, and... It's not worth it. And I've just worked myself to death to get this. That's the way it is sometimes when it comes to this thing of the Christian life and the victory that we've got in Christ and the cross. It's not that we don't have the victory. We've already got the victory. We've got all the victory that we need over every habit, over every thought, over every addiction, over every mean-spirited, self-centered attitude. We've got all the victory we need. The Bible multiple uh, multiple times tells us that we already have that victory. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We are more than conquerors. We are, it's hooper negeo, new hooper negeo, the word Nike is in there. Hooper, we are more in abundance, over and beyond victors, is what the scripture says. Victory is not the problem for us. We got it already. It's not that the potential doesn't exist. The problem is we don't know how to possess the victory we already got. How did Joshua do it? How did they do it? How did the army of Israel do it? Because the whole point of this passage is that the victory didn't have anything to do with Joshua. It didn't have anything to do with Israel. It didn't have anything to do with their, uh, with their military might or their military power or prowess. How did they do it? Well, look at verse 11. What did the scripture say? Verse 11. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses. Now, who's Moses? Moses was the man of God, when Moses, the man of God, held his hand up. Now, what was in his hands? It was the rod. It was the staff of God. Now, what did the rod or the staff of God mean? It represented the presence and the power of Almighty God. It was the Shekinah glory with him. And so it represented the power and the presence of God at his disposal. In other words, every time Moses brought God into that. Every time Moses elevated God, every time Moses lifted God in terms of his presence, his power, when God was brought into it and elevated, Israel prevailed. We don't need to get more of us in the battle. We need to get more of God in the battle and us out. You say, well, how do we do that? Tell me how we do that. How do I get more of God in the battle and us out? Because the Bible says the battle is God's. The battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. He's our banner. He's our victory. So we march under him. 
So how do we get more of him in and us out? It's not hard, but it's extremely difficult. Here it is. Be still and know that I am God. All right, well, that'll just kick you right in the face. Be still. And that word still literally is the idea, stop flailing around. Stop making all the motion. Stop working so hard to win, to defeat, to overcome. Stop. And walk in what's already yours. It's about getting our mind to catch up to the reality of who God says we already are. You know what that comes down to? Belief. Belief. Remember what 1 John said? John said, 1 John. This is the victory that has overcome the world. It's not going to. This is the victory. What is it? Even our faith. You want to know what the victory is? It's believing what God says is so. So, so many people, we used to have a, a, a lady in another church who just really got this. She really did. And she understood what the exchange life meant. And she understood that when challenges came her way, she, she, will, she didn't have to work for certain things to try to get them to happen. She would just start living it. She would just start declaring it. She would just start walking in it. Not, not trying to get to it, but just already saying, hey, look, I believe it. I've already done it. I've already overcome this. I've already won. And she just was a grand model for so many other people in our church to be able to look to and to to be able to emulate because because she got what it meant to believe what God says is already so. We think we have to be a part. We think we have to do so much. And God has already said, I've won the victory. It's already been won in Christ. Everything. All of your healing, like we said last week, you, you, it's already there. It's like prego. It's in there. At the cross, it was all won. You don't have to fight anymore to try to get victory in something, to overcome anything. You don't have to fight anymore. You've already got it. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ lived the victorious, abundant life when he was here on this earth? Do you think he did? I think he did. Do you think he's living the abundant, victorious life right now? Absolutely, I think he is. Well, the Bible says if that you and I are a Christian, if you and I are a believer, then according to the word of God, you've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer you who lives, but it's Christ who lives in you. Now, what that means is that the very same one who lived on this earth, the victorious, abundant life, and the very same one who right now is living that victorious, abundant life is the one who lives in you. Now, how did he do it when he was on this earth? You know how he did it? Here's what he did. You remember when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and he had been struggling with, with the temptation of wanting food? He was fasting for 40 days. You remember how Satan had tried so hard, but here he came to the end of his fasting period when he was the most hungry and the, most, the, most, the, the pains were the loudest. And you remember what Satan tried to get him to do, tried to get him to worship, tried to get him to do certain things. And you remember what Jesus said? Jesus didn't have big struggles. Jesus didn't say, wait a minute, I'm going to work, I'm going to grip my teeth, I'm going to bite, tighten my belt, I'm going to do any of that. You know, he said, it is written. Not once, not twice, but three times. It is is written. You know why? Because he believed that to be so. And the struggle that we have on a day-to-day -day basis 
is believing that we have to work for something. We have to struggle for something. We have to try and try and grit our teeth and we have to work hard and we have to do this and we have to do that. When in reality, God has already said, you've already won. You're already the overcomer. Doesn't mean that you won't have struggle. But you've already won. You've already won. You're already the victor. And so what the message of this name, of this term is, is simply this. The message for us, first of all, is live it. Live out what God says you are. You're not trying to become it. You already are it. And as you already are it, live it. Live it out. The second message is this for us. That if he is our banner, if he's our victory, then we don't have to live in daily defeat anymore. I know some of you perhaps are miserable today for whatever reason. Maybe you've just stewed and stressed yourself out over who knows what. And maybe some of you today are so stressed you couldn't even sleep this morning in church if you needed to. Now for some of you, you can sleep just about any time, but that's just another point. But, but for some of you, for whatever reason, maybe you have, maybe God has just, uh, he maybe seems like he's a million miles away in your life. And you don't, you don't have any joy in your walk anymore. You, you don't have a pep in your step. You don't have a tune on your tongue. You don't have a perk in your work. You don't have anything. And I mean you're miserable because you're just kind of defeated for whatever reason. And I know in every pew there's someone who's sitting in a church like that. And you're just defeated by your losses and the efforts that you've made and you've tried and, and the size of your, stre- uh, of, your, uh, of, your, of your fights and so on. And you've put the energy in and, and, and now you, you know, your pride and your thoughts and temptations and your attitudes and actions and all those addictions and all those kind of things, they keep coming at you and they just keep hurling and you're not living the abundant life. You can see it in your daily life. You can see it in your work relationships. You can see it in your home. You can see it in your marriage and your lifestyle. You're not living anything in any way that deserves to be called the abundant life. But I want to remind you, you can, and it's not impossible. Verse 13 says this. Listen to what it says. It says, so Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. He overwhelmed them. That is, he sorely whooped them. He he won a, a complete victory against them. And I want to remind you, Israel's not even an army. They're just a ragtag, motley crew of folks who came out of bondage. But they won the battle. It's not the size of the enemy. It's not even the size of the efforts. It's the God that you get in on it. The battle is the Lord's. So you can have complete and overwhelming victory. The the third thing, I think, is, is this. If God is our banner and he is our victory, then we ought to tell others. I think that's the message for us. We ought to tell others. Because if you, if you look at this, verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial. Recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built this altar and he named it, the Lord is my banner. And here's what he said. He said, the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Moses wanted others to know. God wanted others to know. The altar was used for two things in those days. The altar was used for worship, and it was used as a witness. Moses wanted this not to be just a memorial to himself. He wanted it to be a message to anybody and everybody that came that way, that God is our victory. God is our banner. And I believe if our victory that we've got in Christ through Jesus is as good as we say it is, then we ought to tell everybody that. Let everybody know how good it is. Let everybody know how valuable it is. If he is our banner, if he is our victory, then it's worth telling. What, what, what would it have been like if Jonah Salk had kept his cure for polio to himself? I mean, wouldn't you think, man, alive, that's just immoral and unethical. Or what if somebody found the cure for cancer and never, ever told another person? That's just immoral. That's, that's unethical. That's inhumane. Well, well, we have an incredible, incredible cause. We have an incredible uh, victory. And that victory was won through Christ at Calvary. And it was won over the Amalekites of our lives. 
So the question for all of us this morning is, what are those Amalekites for us? What are the battles? What are the struggles that you're facing in your flesh this morning? Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a temptation to do your own thing, to call your own shots in your life. Maybe God's been trying to get your attention in some way, and you've just been saying, no, God, hands off, hands off. I can handle it. I can do it. I can manage it. I got my own life under control. Maybe it's that. But, but, but self has been raising its ugly head up over and over again, trying to keep you in the way of the wilderness between Egypt and Canaan. Not that you don't have salvation. Not that you don't have eternal life. Not that you don't have one day victory, but you don't have the joy of the abundant life and the victory now that you're celebrating. What is it? What are your Amalekites that you're up against this morning? Well, the truth of this term, the truth of this name, reminds you, you don't have to fight for victory. Fight in it. You've already got it. Years and years ago, when I was still pastor at St. Simon's Island, um, there was a, a gal there and a couple who had a little boy. He was four years old. Um, he went out on the deck one day, and, of course, there's water all around, and uh, he jumped over uh, the railing and ended up in the water and uh, drowned. And so I had to perform the funeral for this little boy, four years old. And uh, this was years and years ago, one of the most difficult funerals I've ever done because I had a four-year-old at the time. But uh, I'll never forget walking into the hospital, and he was just laid out completely. Uh, he was gone. He was on the ventilator machine. But, um, but I remember they actually were not saved at that point, her or her husband, Dawn, who was her name, and she was not saved. But I remember doing their funeral, and, and I said something in that funeral. I, I, I quoted something, and... Um, of course, I ended up, uh, you know, they were appreciative, and they kind of did their thing and went their way. But several years later, I was invited to come back. And, um, and when I got back, actually, to preach a message at a former church, uh, Dawn was there. And uh, Dawn came up to me after the service. And she took her Bible, and she opened it up. And uh, at this point, uh, several years later, Dawn had actually been saved. And uh, God had got a hold of her life and changed her life and done some wonderful things. But she opened up this, this, this quote that I had said years ago at this funeral uh, for her son. And the quote said this. It said, the way of the cross isn't easy, but it is the way home. And she had written that down, and she showed that to me again as I came back and 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 she was saying to me she said you don't know how hard these last few years of my life have been and so she said that has proven true for me but what I've come to understand is while the way of the cross isn't easy it is my way home and I would say that to you that that daily living is tough and and there's going to be the temptation to get you to live in the wilderness that to fight these battles over and over and over again and to keep you fighting these battles over and over and over again. But, but let me tell you what happens when you go to the cross. When you go to the cross, while, while it may cost you some things, it may cost you some relationships, it may cost you some riches, it may cost you some reliance upon yourself, the truth of the matter is that it's through the cross that you get where you ultimately need to go. Jesus said, if you'll deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. If you'll deny yourself and follow me, you'll find a way home. And, and so that's the way to victory. And so maybe if you've never, ever come to the cross, I want you to start right there. And if you have, I want you to realize that now, based on what you believe, you're either living in it or you're drowning under it. So this morning, the banner that you have is God's. The victory is already yours in him, in Christ. Believe what he says is already so in you. Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around, every eye closed. Every eye closed. Father God, you know our hearts, you know our needs, you know the challenges that we're facing, you know the things that are, that, that are bringing us down today. You know the, the, the frustrations. You know the temptations that we're up against. You know the challenges. 
And it is my prayer, God, this day that we will enjoy, that we will walk in the freedom that we already have. It's your word that said it was for freedom that Christ set us free. God, we already have that freedom. We already have that victory. Help us today, God, to understand how to walk in it, to live it, to appropriate it. Father God, we just pray now that you would give us the strength and the courage to respond to you in whatever way you would have us to. And God, just that we would surrender ourselves, yield ourselves 100% to you in every way possible.